Um, I know the New York Times really prides itself on innovative storytelling. So can you just tell us a little bit about the background of how these photos came about uh, and why you decided to launch this project now? Sure, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, as Maura said, the exhibit is called Hard Truths, and it's, uh, re this is a representative sample of what, was 60 f what is 60 photographs uh, by five different journalists, five different stories of kind of conflict and humanitarian strife and change around the world. Um, and it, you're exactly right, Maura. It, I mean, we have over the last, over the 20 years that I've been at the New York Times, um, but particularly over, I would say, the last five years, been in this kind of constant uh, state of change and innovation to basically take advantage of all of the storytelling tools that are, advantage, are available to us now. Uh, when I you know, started uh, as a journalist 25 years ago or 30 years ago, depending on how you count it, um, actually even more if you count my high school newspaper, but anyway, um, you know, we wrote articles and we illustrated them with photographs and mostly it, it happened like that. And now we understand that photographs, video, um, embedded tweets, um, annotated documents, um, interactive graphics, all can be deployed. And so we now try to talk, instead of, we try to make the first question that we talk about when a reporter and editor are having a conversation about initiating a project is, what's the best way to tell this story? And instead of like, how long is it gonna be? You know, it's really, What's the best way to tell the story? What are the tools available to us? What's going to work best for this? So, so the work on the wall of the tent um, is is a reflection of some of the most ambitious photo-led journalism that we've done in the last few years. We have a, um, a series of portraits from Iran, and my colleague Nusha Tavakolian is going to be here tomorrow uh, to talk about that work. Um, we have photographs from Syria and Iraq um, during the about the fall of Mosul. We have. Uh, to photographs from the Philippines and President Duterte's anti-drug war, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2016, or the prize for 2016. We have uh, some amazing, they look like paintings on the wall, photos by Tomas Munita um, called Cuba on the Edge of Change. And this is Cuba before Barack Obama's historic visit in 2016. And then we have uh, Venezuela, pictures from Venezuela over the last couple of years in their economic and humanitarian crisis. Did I miss anything? No, I believe that's that's the five. Um, and all of these were published um, in kind of digital, uh, innovative, uh, experienced ways that are immersed you um, in the photography. And we decided to, sorry, I'm going on and on here, but um, we decided to put it together into this exhibit um, as part of our kind of outreach to uh, grow our audiences outside the United States and what we really believe is that as people understand our journalism better they'll appreciate our journalism more and we just really wanted to to take the photos and put them into a new context um, and to one of the thick reasons to do it is to, to go and have discussions about um, our truths and about the process of, of bearing witness to them. So one of the things I am um, I read a recent article in The Guardian and it was it came from uh, Roxanne Gay, who I believe works with you at the New York Times, and it was the idea of compassion fatigue. So obviously each of these photos tells a really important and powerful story. How do you think so the, 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 the term fashion fatigue is if you are um, shown a stream of horrendous images which we are saturated in now in the news, how do you show these photos and encourage people to engage with them rather than see horrendous things and then which may make them want to withdraw rather than engage? It's a great question. I'm just like looking at the photos as we're talking. I think, I mean, uh, we were having a conversation yesterday about um, some, some brain research that some academics have done about what makes a photo stick in people's memories and what doesn't. Um, is we were talking about Syria in particular and the migrant crisis, and um, you all remember the, the picture of Alan Kurdi on the beach, and everybody kind of can recognize that photo, and then any number of photos of other, other aspects of the migration crisis or of the Syrian war, when they were showed to people, even though they'd been on the front page of the New York Times, people didn't recognize them. 
And it's very interesting if you look, I mean, I think one of the, one of the, the guy I was talking to, Tim, who's here, was saying that the issue about how memorable a photo is has to do with empathy, and that empathy has to do with how much you can connect your own experience to it. Um, and his argument was that the photo of the little boy on the beach didn't feel like it was a photograph of a faraway war. It kind of looked like any boy on a beach, and mm. we've all kind of been to beaches and maybe seen a, a toddler napping or lying down in the sand. Um, and it, just, it struck me when we looked at the photographs on the wall here, we have two different photographs of children, which are amazing, amazing photographs and easily could become in your head, you know, memorable and kind of the, the face of, of the war, although both of them have, instead of that context of the beach that's so relatable, they have contexts that very much make you feel removed from it in a way. They're both, you know, one is of a of a destroyed neighborhood and the other is of a, of a massive line of, of refugees, I think, or, or some other groups were kind of rounded up in the war. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's a long way of not answering your question. What do you do about compassion fatigue? I, not sure. I'm not sure I believe it, really. I mean, I think, I think that we have an endless capacity to care about things that matter if they're explained and shown to us in compelling and careful ways. I think people. Have Do you think there's the risk of because now news is is everywhere and every disaster has to be more dramatic than the last and you know things have to progress because people want to draw in readers. Do you think there's any risk? of journalists, photojournalists, overstepping a line where they um, maybe are um, showing photos as sensitively oh. as should be because I it mean, has to be more, more graphic? Or do you think that's, that's not an, an issue when you are working in you know, war, war-torn war countries? I mean, I th I'm sure there is a risk. I think it's probably, you know, whatever. Life is full of risk and, and this is a complicated business. I think, but I, I really, I don't think that it's about the most dramatic. I think it's about the most memorable. Mm. And what's memorable? Um, is it bombs going off? Is it scale? Or is it, you know, humanity? And I think actually, I mean, these photographs are really good examples of this. I think, I mean, if you look at uh, the Philippines' work, the, the photo that's yellow and right in the middle, it's an incredibly quiet, powerful mm. photograph. That was the lead photograph of the digital presentation. Um, is it dramatic? Is it sort of shouting at you? Not really, but it's, it's, you know, kind of gruesome and horrible and it's very much about being there. Um, I think it's, it's, there's some kind of, there's a couple, I'm not sure if this photograph, the fire photograph from Venezuela is the right one to, to express this other kind of photograph, but, you know, we have a number of photographs in, obviously in the paper every day and, and in the Venezuela work of dangerous, you know, fiery, you could tell people could, are about to get blown up or shot kind mm. of the photos. Um, I think the ones that are more intimate are actually probably more memorable and better, and it's the same, it's the same in the word business, you know, it's mm. the it really is stories of individuals placed into the context of the whole that stick with people and mm. that are the way to, I don't know if they're the way to get readers in a kind of clickbaity sense, but they're the way to keep readers. Yeah. Sure if you come away remembering a story or if you come away feeling like you understand a story better, I think that's the meaningful interaction with our journal. And I guess it must vary the medium in which you view a photo, because I'd seen these photos, for example, on my, you know, on my computer screen and on my phone. And when you see something in small, it's completely different to when you see something in large scale. Do you think the way people interact with these photos, when it's in our exhibition, when it's in a gallery, and you can stand and actually take time to see the depth of them, do you think that is a completely different way to engage? Yeah, with them? we've thought about this a lot. I mean, we we always deal with this already in our. I mean in a way that we, my predecessors didn't have to, right? Because on every story that we do, we've got the phone, the desktop, uh, and the print. And, mm. you know, we often use the photographs differently for each of those experiences. And so we use photographs in the context of a museum exhibit or a gallery exhibit. Um, and it debuted at Sotheby's. 
um, where the lighting was like incredible. We walked in and it, w it was really an incredible experience to see photographs that, I mean, you know, we were quite proud of these photographs and we'd looked at them 8,000 times and they were prize winning photographs. They didn't need a lot of help. Mm -hmm. And yet when they were presented in that setting, it was kind of stunning how much more there was of them. Uh, with the light. And then a couple of interesting things happened. Um, we had a bunch of kind of events around the exhibit that we invited people to. And then Sotheby's had this open house with champagne and music where people wander the galleries on a Friday night. Like a thousand people. It was kind of an incredible thing. <laughs> and they didn't even know this exhibit existed. And there they were with their champagne kind of wandering by it. Um, and we were really interested to watch them and watch how they interact. Because most of them are not very easy to look at. They're pretty mm. tough photos. It's called hard truths. Now in Edinburgh, it's up in a bar at one of the fringe um, venues. And then I encourage you after this to go check out. There's these photos, but we also have versions of them on the stone wall outside. And they are slightly bigger and on these kind of... I want to say burlap, but I guess it's probably more like vinyl kind of banners. They're weatherproof was the idea. And looking at them that way against the stone wall is an entirely different experience. So mm. I don't have an answer for kind of uh, what does it mean to look at them this way, but it is certainly different to look at photos. I mean, also, you know, each of these stories were published at a time when the conflict was kind of raging or happening and Iran was in the news and Cuba was changing. And now that's not true. These are stories that, you know, were important, you know, yesterday or whenever. Mm. Uh, so what's the value of looking at them now? Um, is it, it's not quite history. Is it history? I, you know, I think there's a ton of questions around this, and I think it's part of what's cool about doing this exhibit is to raise that question. What's a news mm. photograph in a new context mean? And start the conversation. Yeah. yeah. And on the conversation, um, how can you involve young people more into into the into these photos, into multimedia storytelling. Um, before this ex exhibit was launched, what conversations were had at the New York Times about how these kind of projects can actually, um, yeah, draw young people into your readership? I'm not sure we had that many much thought that much about young people in relation to this exhibit, but we think about young people all the time in terms of different forms of storytelling, and you know we know, I mean. It is, it is a profound transformation that the vast majority of our readers consume our journalism on their phone. Um, it's in the palm of their hand. Um, it's mixed up with text messages from their friends or spouses or parents, um, as well as like pictures on Facebook of, you know, whether it's your college roommates going on or whatever. So we understand that that's a completely uh, different experience from looking at a printed newspaper. Also. You know, most people are consuming us in little bits throughout the day, not kind of in a sitting, mm -hmm. as our parents maybe consumed their news. So those things are transformational, and we think about them all the time in terms of, well, what does that mean about how we should tell our stories? And we know that, you know, young people live more, uh, consume information much more visually than my generation did, so that's one of the reasons that we're doing more visual journalism and being more purposeful about that. Uh, we've also, you know, use a much more conversational tone in a lot of our journalism. Um, we're doing more explanatory pieces. And I think all of those are ways in which we think that both the medium and the younger audience can, can make the journalism more accessible for, yeah. for the younger audience, sorry. And I guess for, for a lot of young people, when they engage in social media and when they engage in politics, when they read whichever newspaper they subscribe to, that can often influence the way they obviously think about the world, but also the way that they take action in the world. Do you feel like um, this exhibition, at, do you feel like that um, there was the idea that you want people to then go and look beyond the photos of the politics and the stories you know, behind them, or was it more of a, um, a kind of visual experience to, to the photos? An expression of, you know, kind of the highest calling of journalism, which is to bear witness and hold power to account. That's what all these stories are about. They're about being there and, and seeing uh, what conflict wreaks on, on humanity. Um, and we present, we do that work. We, we do the bearing witness and holding power to account to help people understand the, the complicated world that they live in and how, how they choose to sort of react to that. What understanding brings different people in terms of action or next steps is sort of beyond our call or our purview. So I think mm. it's, 
I'm sure for some people this is just about, I was going to say art, I mean it's not, I mean it's for some people yeah, it's a visual experience to, um, to, to look at photographs and think about how they're made, uh, maybe hear the photographers talk about how they're made. Um, I think for other people it's much more about the content, mm -hmm. what is this telling me about the Philippines or Venezuela or Cuba? I don't know. I guess it's up to the viewer, the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Has there been a particular p point of this process, of these photographs that you've particularly enjoyed, or you know, a kind of moment in this um, in this journey that really stands out for you? Yeah. So when we were in London, um, we had all the five photographers as well as their editor there, and it, we we hadn't we did these gallery talks where we just had each of them talk about their work, and I kind of interviewed them. It was not really planned, and it was just cool. I mean, I kind of know the work well, and I knew some of them better than others, and uh, hearing them talk about their work was pretty incredible, and I really do encourage you to come here, Nusha. Um, she's an amazing woman. She's from Tehran, and um, it's not a place uh, where women have a lot of uh, ability to do whatever they want, but she does whatever she wants in a really remarkable way. I also think, I mean, actually the other piece that's just been so cool for me is this this thing I was talking about before about just seeing them presented in different contexts. Mm. I was really, yesterday when I walked in here and saw those weatherized versions on the wall, I just was blown away by it, and I was mm. equally blown away by the lit versions in Sotheby's, and so, I can't wait to see what we do next. No, it's really it's really neat to see that that thing of these. What does it mean to change the context of a photo? And they'll be traveling now for the next two years. Yeah. So for yeah, well, so the next place they're going, I, they're at, at the assembly rooms in Edinburgh right now, and they're going to go to Summer Hall for the month of September, and then they'll be at uh, the London School of Economics for the month of yes. October, and the rest of the agenda is to be announced. But we've got some ideas about Mexico and Hong Kong and all sorts of places. Fantastic. And New York. Eventually we'll come to New York. Yeah. The, and the, the New Yorkers keep asking me, when are we going to get in New York? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to start in New York? You want to prioritize? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> we love New York, but we're a global news organization. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So I think we'll open up to the, the audience just for the last 10 minutes if anyone's got any questions at all. Switch it on, yeah. Thank you, that was fascinating. Um, are there any photographs that, for an exhibition like this you consider off-limits? Like, uh, too gross? Yeah. Uh, gross isn't really the right word. Too um, graphic, thank you. Um, that's a really good question. So in the Philippines story, which the, we have two images here from that story, the blue and the yellow. All, uh, his images, Daniel, Vera who likes images, um, are amazing the way they use color. And many of them actually are kind of one color. It was really interesting to look at them on the wall in Sotheby's that way. Um, we, when we published um, the, the story, we had a, a warning label on the story about the graphic nature of the images. That we've had a, done that a few times. This was, I think, the most explicit and the highest up one we've ever done. It, it, you know, he basically documented murder scenes. They're pretty grim. Um, you know, and I, I think I don't know the answer to your question because David, my colleague, really did the edit of each of these stories and whether he left out any because it would just feel terrible on the wall, but I mean, I mean, you've got this little boy. This story is really incredible. This is like one of the last guys out of Mosul, and uh, he comes out carrying this boy, and the the soldiers basically think he's a terrorist who's using the boy as a human shield to avoid detection because he doesn't seem to know anything about the boy, um, and there's this whole kind of interrogation that goes on but we've got this photo and I don't I don't know if we have it here but the, there's a Venezuela photo of there, actually there's a Philippines photo of a little girl crying by her father's open coffin open I can't remember and there's a, a photo of another another photo with a coffin in the Venezuela work so they're pretty grim I don't think we were too careful <laughs> um, 
it was funny with the Sotheby's and the champagne looking at the grim photos of death. And I think it was also interesting um, in that setting, right? People are like, well, can I buy the photograph? And kind of Cuba is almost the only one that you can imagine really hanging in your home, which was sort of another interesting thing. I don't think anybody would really want the little boy from Mosul in their house, in their living room. It would be a little odd, right? So again, again, it's like context is sort of everything. I don't know. We chose to do hard truths because um, we, we could have done it a lot of other ways, right? We could have done stories of... There, we do lots of photojournals and it's not grim and about death. Um, but we chose to do this because we thought it really was the, the value we wanted to express was about bearing witness and about conflict and about difficult truths. So um, everybody's got a mobile phone these days um, with a good camera on it, and I'm wondering how is that, that is impacting on the work of professional photographers because they're there at the time. And, yeah, it's yeah. a great question, um, which I'm going to answer in a little bit of an upside-down way. Because one of the things we've really struggled with, I mean, our reporters also have those phones, right? And sometimes they're in places that they don't, they aren't with photographers. They didn't expect to need a photographer, or they didn't plan ahead, and suddenly something's happening in there. And um, I would say a few years ago, so we have that phenomenon, we also have the phenomenon of every source has photographs all the time. Um, every activist is videotaping or photographing every politician. So there's a flood of citizen photography happening as well. What do we do with all this stuff? And we know that you know everybody else is publishing the same, this kind of stuff. So a few years ago, we had a, a an ad, the attitude was basically like, that's not the New York Times. This is the New York Times. It's about professionals and fancy equipment and, and great eye and about you know, and that's totally transformed in the last couple of years. We now have different formats and templates and ways to use all that photography. Um, we we will never lose this kind of work. Um, there's a there's a value in this kind of work that I think can't be matched by any citizen photographer or reporter with an iPhone. But there's also a value in that um, in those other kinds of photos and visuals and video. And so we've tried to find ways to present those things in in a different context that is more about like putting you on the ground and being there. We did a lot in Syria of citizen video or um, or selfie video because there was an access to Aleppo as it was falling, you know. So, I mean, I think that was really valuable. We did this one piece of a bunch of uh, Syrians talking about where they were with food during a particular part of the war. That was all self-shot. and You know, it wasn't beautiful, but it, like, really put you in, like, when they, this one person walked around their kitchen and showed its barrenness. I, you know, I still have that in my head. It's been two years. So I think there's real value in that, and we just have to balance it and show it in different contexts. Um, so yeah, thank you all. Jodie, thank you so much. That was thank so you, fascinating. Maura. And um, yeah, I hope you all enjoy looking at the photos. <laughs>